One will be, I think I told you, boom bust cycle, and the other one, triangle. Sure, that's fine. Have to do that one. And that would lead to reforms, but also triangle. And there will also be, I think, like 20 multiple choice of like dimensions. So those are the only two short IDs then? I'm going to look at the test. I can't remember if I gave you a choice of one or not. Three short IDs and then a short expectation. I can't remember about three or two. Okay. So I might have. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what are the I wrote it last week, I can't remember. I couldn't decide how many short IDs to give you. Okay. Well, no, I could decide to give you three short IDs and then a short answer question, right. or two short IDs. Oh. I was weighing, I was going back and forth, I couldn't decide. What would you write that? Four short IDs? No. Five? But seven? Are three short IDs, can you tell us the third one? I'll look at it. Let me, let, I'll get the test tomorrow and I'll remind you. <laughs> but I probably not. Okay, so let's go ahead then and take out your notes and let's go and finish up our work. If we get to what kind of city government does Helena have? City manager, city what? City council. What does it mean when it says no political parties in an election? Yeah, that's nonpartisan. Who was the muckraker who exposed the Standard Oil Company? Yeah, Arden Tarbell. And you can see about the fact that women simply did not have or were able to get, get jobs and that level of reporting, and for that matter, to get the respect that tells you how the officer she had to go through. She was a pretty amazing person. And so we already said they're anti monopoly and trust their or progressives were what regulation. They also believe that societies were capable of doing what? Yeah, improving. And what is that idea of society, society can improve? Oh, that means they're not what is called for hands off. Yeah, they're not laws I fair. And what is it called? Where they wanted to pick, um, take the working class and make more of the working class into the middle class so they feel more part. Yeah, social justice. Because they thought if we don't do that, it might lead to a what? Yeah, some kind of revolution, a revolt. And who knows which way it will go? Either towards anarchism, is their, their point of view, or dictatorship. And yeah, that was a very real possibility. And then they had great faith, the last part about their characteristics of what kind of people that could solve all their problems and we should elect them. The experts, these trained professionals, get rid of the party machines and money. So we got city manager. Did we write down Wisconsin? We were on state And one name we have to get for Wisconsin, Robert Law Follett. Robert Law Follett was the he was governor and then senator from Wisconsin. He was a reformer. And he'd actually get over 20% of the vote for president in 1924 as a third party candidate. So very well known. And this would be kind of a training ground for progressive ideas. They would, a number of social justice ideas about you know, child labor laws, or for that matter, they try to get it down to a 45 hour work week and a few other things. So, Wisconsin would do a number of these. So, let's go through a few of them that Wisconsin is kind of the where it's our, by the way, almost all of these Montana would adopt right away. Montana was a very progressive state. And so, the first one the old Australian ballot. How do we know it's an Australian ballot? Down. It's up to down, down. If you flush it, it goes kind of far. Yeah, that's science. And they were the first one to do two things. They did a secret ballot and standardized ballot. Where everybody would get the same ballot. The idea being there won't be some thug watching you, a plug ugly, watching you, threatening or threaten you if you don't vote for, if it's a plug ugly, vote for the Democrats. Or your boss saying you better vote that way or I'll fire you. And anybody know what a plug is? Imagine a wooden handle with a big steel hook like that. And they would use this plug 
It did a couple different things, but they used it to poke holes in the leather to start like a buttonhole. But also they used a plug if you wanted to move a side of beef, you hook it and then drag it to a big, heavy hook. And they'd stand up there with a hook and say, are you sure you want to vote for the Republican? See, you're a Democrat now. And then if you're not, go fish over. Do you know what I mean by fish over? Hmm? Yeah, that's a little hole. But now, a lot of people said, hey, if you go out, if they have a secret ballot, you go into the voting booth and you can do anything you want, like cheating. And so that's what they, they said. They said the open ballot actually keeps people from cheating. Well, no. <laughs> actually, the people who benefited from them wanted to make sure they could continue, continue to intimidate. And so that would be a big reform. And it, Australia was the first, this dominion, actually, Australia was a number of dominions. It wasn't yet considered like one single country until after World War I. But the Dominion of Britain, they were the first one to do these two things. And one thing we should add about this. This coincided with a movement in states to begin to register voters. The idea being to avoid fraud. People who didn't live in that era, era, area or could try to impersonate another voter, which almost never happened. That could never happens, but that was the thought they could use it. But another thing they wanted is they wanted registered voters because there was an element of, remember that faith in experts, that many voters were not smart enough or there was something else wrong with them where they could not make a valuable decision. And so they wanted to get qualified voters. So if you could register a process to make it more difficult for people to vote, you take away some of the unqualified voters. That's their point of view. What's an unqualified voter? Actually, you're on the right track there. Someone who doesn't vote for you, you get rid of. But they what? They weren't smart enough. They didn't know enough. So you get one of these strange dichotomies where you have somebody talking about we want fair and safe elections, and they'll talk about direct democracy all the time, and yet they also want to keep people from voting. So how do they think about or what laws do they kind of like in the South? Jim Crow. Yeah, those, those Jim Crow laws. Remember the literacy test, the poll tax. Many progressives were for this. So you had this strange series of contradictions of the progressives in that era. And it's going to have very, very mixed results. And we're still stuck with this. And there's a lot of issues with this. Because it, it puts in barriers, it makes it harder to vote. You put barriers up to try, you try to keep people from voting. So next, the direct primary. So here's a part of this contradiction. A direct primary, instead of having party leaders, and they always had smoke filled rooms because everybody smoked, but party leaders choosing the candidates, they would have voters choose party nominees. And over the next 40 years, all, every state would have primaries for state elections. And national elections a little bit more down the road. President wouldn't happen until on the national level, 1972 for the Democrats, 1976 for Republicans. So what it means is this. Let's say for governor in Montana. Montana, our state constitution had, has been amended through initiative to say that there, we have term limits, only two terms. For government. So 2020, it's going to be an open seat. Well, it can't run again. And there are already two prominent Republicans who have announced that they're going to enter the Republican nominating primary to try to become their candidate. It's the Attorney General. Do we know the other? The Secretary of State, Corey State. And they're both jumping in. And in June of 2020, they will, the state of Montana has their, um, their primary elections. And so Republicans will go vote for, there are probably a couple more jump in that race, for whichever Republican they want to represent the party in November, and Democrats will do the same. And you see that for all the state level races and house races, et cetera. It's happening for the president of the United States, and it'll be 
June of 2020 for president. And right now there are 10 Democrats who have jumped in. And there could be as many as another now. Yeah. Now it's count, I'm counting, um, Oh, my Senator from Chair Brown from Ohio. I think he's going to jump in. He's got to be and so, and there'll probably be as many as ten more jump in. And there's a lot that I think are you know, they're running to sell a book and get their name out there. There's a few that are I think clearly running to be chosen vice president down the road. And yes, they're talking about Governor Bullock. He's still listed as somebody who might jump in. It's kind of a he'd be a dark horse. Somebody to come in, so it's something to see. But but the best thing about the nominating thing for president, he'll already be decided by the time this Montana, so it won't matter too much. But more um, power to the hands of the people and out of the machines. So this is another one to weaken party machines. Weaken party machines. Next. The recall. Not all the states have a recall, but the only way to remove an elected official was impeachment. Impeachment is very difficult and divisive. A recall, voters can remove office holders. Okay, I'm tired. It's hard to write this way. <laughs> so what happened is you get a petition process, and if you get enough, every state has a different process, and not all the states have recall. But if you get enough people signing a petition, there'll be an election whether or not to remove an elected official. And some have it, the election is to remove the elected official and pick the new one. Montana hasn't done it for like 80 years because they're very divisive. So Wisconsin actually tried to remove their governor and four members of the state senate back in 2010. And that governor just lost for re-election in 2018, so I guess it took 18 years or eight years. It's very divisive. The most famous one, 2002, that summer. So most of you were probably alive. I right? don't remember who he was. 2002? Governor Gray Davis was blamed for high energy prices. It wasn't his fault, but you know, like governors and presidents, sometimes they get too much credit, sometimes they get too much blame. And they recalled him. And California's got a really weird law where they voted to recall them, and then they've had a ballot vault with over 180 names. To replace it because basically it was like a ten dollar filing fee you're on the ballot so people were just were putting their name up there and so they had all kinds of people from just people off the street a couple of people just graduated from high school a couple of porn stars they all jumped into the race and who did they elect <laughs> they elected arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> A bad yet full of steroids actor. Yes. Okay. Yeah, he's bad. But full of steroids. And he got elected. That's another story for later on. And referendum. The referendum, and that's an N. This my N kind of looks like a U, doesn't it? But the the referendum's a little bit different. So what we have is, it's a vote, and we have a bill that starts with the legislature and then goes to the voters. So it's, usually these are pretty controversial bills, and the idea is we'll let the voters decide, or maybe the legislature might be the president, the governor might not sign it. Some states have that. It could be a constitutional amendment that has to go to a referendum process, that's the way Montana is. Or that's a term limits, for example, was a constitutional amendment that was had to be approved by the voters. In Montana, any increase in the sales tax, or, or I'm sorry, to have a sales tax, has to go to the referendum process. The last time that happened was in 1993. It lost 70% to 30%, or just about that. And there's a group of Republicans, Republicans that wanted to get sales tax for years. And they know it's very unpopular. But they're pushing again to cut some taxes for the very top income earners and replace that with the sales tax that we're going to use. And I don't know if we'll get to the referendum. I don't think it will get there. But it's happening right now. So it's interesting to see how it kind of comes back to this. Last one, the initiative. 
And the initiative, same idea, but now the bill starts with voters and then goes for a vote. It starts with voters through a petition process. This kind of petition, usually pretty narrow, it has to be a bill that can only affect one law. And for example, without like medical marijuana was an initiative, that kind of thing. Montana has it, not every state has these. And the whole idea of these, all of them, was more direct democracy. Take the power out of the hands of big money interests and the political machines and put it into the hands of qualified voters who will choose experts. And part of the progressive idea of education is as we become more educated, well, more qualified voters. Well, so the whole idea is to make voters feel more part of the system. All of these, the idea is voters will feel like they have more power, and therefore, to the progressive point of view, more people involved in the system who therefore want to protect it and avoid revolution. So it has a similar idea as social justice. Did it work? No. It was a dismal failure on every effort. And it's not to say that some of these things are, are bad. And as individual, they might have worked and done a lot of good. But as a whole, it did not do what the progressives wanted at all. What happened to voter turnout every election for the next 90 years after the progressive era? Voter turnout, so the number of eligible voters went down virtually every cycle up until the 1990s. And part of the reason it quit dropping in the 1990s is because it got so low. It's like, how could you get any lower when you have less than 50% of the voting population voting for the president? Presidential elections. I think the worst year might have been either 2010 or 2014 for the midterm elections, about a third vote. I mean, people did not vote. And clearly what happened is that they did not feel like they have a role in this direct democracy. More and more voters felt like they were outside the system, and so why vote? And no, that's not the correct attitude, but it's also understandable. The reason why this happened, why voter turnout dropped so much, is because partially it was a success, but had unintended consequences. Political parties crashed. Political parties declined in power dramatically to what we have today. Very, very, very weak political parties. Now, some of you who do follow politics might be thinking, well, wait a second, aren't they really partisan, divided Democratic, Republican in the House? And they, yeah, that could be, but we have a situation where almost 40% of Americans claim to be independent if they vote at all. That means they do not feel that the party doesn't have anything to offer. And the problem with that is it leads a big hole. You go from people being part of a party, which is something greater, to 40% of the population are free agents. Free agents, one vote if you're a free agent, is not a lot. You need a lot of votes to get something done. With one individual vote, it's like, well, what does it matter? You got a population of 330 Americans. Did I say 330? We've shrunk a lot over the last few years. It was about 330. <laughs> Earth rates have declined. No. So, here's what happens. If political parties decline in power, how this affects voting is this. Parties provide a couple, three really big things. Parties provide education, and parties get out the vote. By the way, let's get out the vote. That's, they, this is the acronym now for get out the vote. Go TV. Get it? I didn't make it up. <clears throat> but a big thing parties do is give you a party identification. Not just, you know, if someone's a, if parties are strong, you say, well, they're a Democrat or a Republican. You say, I know what they stand for. It's more important that they give the voter identification. Political parties help people feel part of the system. Voters feel part of the system. Voters feel connected when they're members of political parties, if they're strong. 
If you don't believe me, go look up what strong political parties are in France or Germany, or even to a lesser degree, Britain. They really feel part of it. They think I'm part of this greater thing. I'm a, I'm a Republican, and I know people who say they're Republican, they believe these things. And we're all voting together with them. And they get to office and they do something different, then we'll get them out of office. We'll put someone in who does believe what we want. They feel part of it. It's like, it's, yes, we're a part of a bigger system. My vote matters because I'm voting with all these other voters. I'm voting with all these other like minded people. If you're a free agent, well, it doesn't mean quite as much. It loses its power. And so what happens is people begin to feel disconnected. They feel disconnected. That's why you get every election, fewer and fewer people vote. Until now, maybe things are changing. They set a record. You have to go back to the progressive era when we had voting, voter turnouts as high as it was in the midterm election as it was in 2018. You have to go back to 1912. That's like, wow, this was big. Is it a one time thing? Uh -huh. Younger people voted more. And younger people don't vote. So that was a big deal. Maybe things are changing. That's, that would be really good. Older people vote more, but still not that much. And so, what replaces it? Well, here's the deal. If the voters become free agents, and the parties have less power, how do people choose a candidate? Candidates, what do they have to emphasize more? And I mentioned this when I talked about the law cabin and hard cider campaign back in 1840 and 1896 with McKinley versus Bryan. What becomes more important than who you are, what you stand for, what you did in your life? What becomes more important? You remember? Image. Image becomes even more important. Not substance, image. Portraying something. Or between your opponent as something else. You know, I'm part of this team and they're part of the bad team, but it's not really what they did. That becomes more important. So politics become more superficial. If politics become more superficial, one more voters feel less, you know, what does it matter? You know, between twiddly D and twiddly dumb kind of thing. And then who fills the vacuum? It's special interests. Special interest groups start in this era. And special interest groups are not representing all voters. They represent a very narrow interest. So things like, and don't think just like big business. It would be like the coal industry and railroads and steel, or for that matter, labor unions and different groups and labor unions, like very specific groups, or especially by the 1960s, environmental groups. Special interest, narrow groups that only care about one issue. So a lot of people are being left out of They don't represent that issue. They support both parties. And what can special interest groups provide? How do you get your interest, your image out? What do you need? And that's what special interests provide, the money. So who becomes more important? Narrow special interests. So if narrow special interest groups become more important, how do voters feel? And so they more drop out which leads to more power and special interests, which mean more voters drop out. You see an issue here. It didn't happen the way they wanted. They weakened the parties and replaced it with money. And that's one of the problems. Money is pretty much everywhere. That's actually a pretty big deal. And it's kind of affects things today. I'm really curious to see where things are going. Because in the last election, there were a number of candidates who ran with only small donations and not the big money interest. And that could be a radical change. Or, or people lose interest again and start looking at their phone. So next, here's the thing. Remember the Commerce Clause. Do you remember way back when I talked about those Granger laws that tried to regulate railroad rates? And interstate commerce meant they were thrown out by the courts? Same thing with state level reforms. They could do some reforms at the state, but interstate commerce will throw them out. You can do some reforms, but interstate commerce throws out child labor laws. Interstate commerce will throw out 40-hour um, work week. 
because those companies cross state lines or any number of things. And that is why the national progressives would become even more important. And when I mean the national progressives, I'm talking about, because of that, commerce clause. It had to go national. The same reason the populace needed a national election. And that's why when it really would happen, it'd be at the national stage. In 1901, Teddy Roosevelt became president. He loved the initials TR, and that became kind of his calling card. And that's why his cousin who idolized him called himself FDR, right? Then Delano Roosevelt. And future Democrats for the next 30 years would always try to get their initials. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, JFK, Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ. Everyone look at LBJ. Everyone look at LBJ. Everyone look at LBJ. Look! And Danny DeVito, DDV. And so with that, Hubert Horatio Humphrey, H cubed. Okay, so, and Teddy Roosevelt was not quite identified as a progressive for a while, but he would be sympathetic. One of the first things he did is he would get the moniker Trust Buster. Not because he broke up a lot of monopolies, but he was the first American president to really use the Sherman Antitrust Act. And the big one to be best known at is initiated, even though it'll be done after the next president, Standard Oil because of Standard Oil after Ida Tarbell's muckraking reports. Too many R's. There's also called the Northern Securities Trust, but we're not gonna get into that. Well, I better write that one down. The Northern Securities Trust. And that was a railroad trust that would eventually become, they broke that one up, Northern Security. It would become the Great Northern, or it would become the Burlington Northern in 1972. Now it's the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. But way back in 1905, Roosevelt's Justice Department stopped that as being a monopoly. Now we have monopolies everywhere. That's another thing that's coming back into the conversation, antitrust stuff. It's really going to be something. So. Roosevelt, though, would come into his own, so to speak, when he ran for his first real presidential term on his own. Remember, he wasn't elected president. He was the vice president. And so, in 1904, Roosevelt ran with the square deal. He gave it a slogan, a name. He would be the Republican nominee, but now he could win the not the presidency on its own merit. It's awful tough when the vice president comes in because they're always kind of in the shadow of the former president. You see that with Lyndon Johnson a lot. So the square deal. That they, they added A in there later. His cousin would follow that. What was FDR's program? The New Deal. Harry Truman had the fair deal. Then they ran out of deals for a while. And John Kennedy was the new frontier. Lyndon Johnson was the Great Society. Richard Nixon was in federalism. Dwight Eisenhower was done conservatism. Now there's talk of a Green New Deal, so they're coming back to the slogan. And the big thought about the slogan, it gives somebody something for people to, to hold on to. Even if they don't know the details of it, it could be like, you know, for the square deal. What does it mean? I don't care, but I trust. Teddy Roosevelt, he's going to give me a square deal. So it's great to have that slogan in a way. And so a number of things is one, it should sound familiar. It's just like the populace. In our working day, child labor laws. What's the name for the old age pension today? Passed under FDR's presidency. Yeah, probably the most important government program. Since you guys are not going to retire for a while, you might not think about it as much. Every year, I think about it more. Next, uh, things like, you know, workman's comp. You know, most of this would not happen until the New Deal. It made it very public. Progressive income tax, which raises wages. And once I'll talk about that again when we get to FDR. Uh, 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 inherited tax, but I'll talk about that then later. 
um, regulation, and not just antitrust, but also railroad regulation and consumer protection. Conservation of the environment. There's more. They, they also talk about health care, but that wouldn't become a big issue in uh, 1908 or not sorry, 1912. Education. And these are, you know, this is social justice. That's what he looked at. And Republicans like Marcus Hanna, they were infuriated with this, but they made a decision. He doesn't really need it, does he? He didn't really push for it his first two and a half years as president. He's one of us. He wants money. So they funneled money into its campaign with the assumption is that Roosevelt didn't really mean it. And he would easily defeat the conservative Democrat, Alvin Parker. In fact, stopped. Wasn't even close. What, what section of the country voted for Parker? What section voted for Democrats in? No. Yeah. Because Roosevelt wasn't even on the ballot. But what a big victory. Then Roosevelt turned around and made it very clear, you can give me all the money you want. But I'm going to do this because it's white. Now that might be admirable if you agree with him, but he met a lot of enemies, and that's why he could not run again in 1908, and they would not give him the nomination in 1912. And most of these things did not happen. What did he have success on? <coughs> the Hepburn Act would strengthen the ICC. So that was success. What what acts were passed after the jungle? Yeah, yeah. FDA yeah. Meat Inspection Act. Anything else? Conservation was the other one. They create the Forest Service, and there's something called the Monuments Bill, but I'm not I'm not going to go into that. But his idea of conservation was not the same as environmentalism, which we just began, but really big pick up in the mid to late 1960s. It was to conserve for later use. Only 3% of the original forests were left by, by, by 1900, and the thought was, we'll run out of trees. That's why the Forest Service is part of the agricultural department, or the uh, agriculture department. We'll save the forests to cut them down later. We'll save animals so we can shoot them later. I'm talking about Roosevelt one. That's what he wanted. Yeah. Um, all of the act kind of makes sense, but why do you need That's the name of the Congress. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, it's a senator from New York. Okay. But one more thing we have to get. The Bureau of Reclamation. The Reclamation Act. If anyone's involved in agriculture, you might not you might know what this is. And this was a name given, the idea was, okay, it's dry. And the thought was, let's reclaim this land. How do you reclaim it? Irrigation. Think about conservation. You don't want to waste the, the uh, resources we have. And what happens to most fresh water? It just runs right out to the sea, doesn't it? So how do we conserve that water to use it to reclaim the soil for agriculture? What do we build? This will be the biggest dam building program ever. Don't tell me that's not fun to say, huh? Then most of the dams would actually be built under his cousin in the New Deal. But over the next 60 years, pretty much any place in the continent of the United States that could have a dam has a dam. They're everywhere. And go out to Canyon Ferry. It's Bureau of Reclamation. It provided irrigation, but also provided what? Power. You go to Hauser, Bureau of Reclamation. It says it right on. You drive it. You drive over Canyon Ferry, Bureau of Reclamation. Fort Peck, Bureau of Reclamation. So on. They dam everywhere. Any place with granite, dam. Can't build on limestone. They found that out when they thought a few million tons of, of, of cement would fill in the limestone under the Teton Dam, your voice. Went in 1974, killed 300 people. So there's only a few places left in the continent of the United States that's good for a dam that doesn't have one. Like in the middle of Yellowstone, right the Yellowstone Canyon at Yellowstone, Yosemite National Park. They just about build all of them. 
There's a dam right here called um, Glen Canyon Dam, and that's on limestone. Dam. And they've used something like 200 million tons of TNT. Uh, TNT. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to pour it one day. <laughs> With cement to try to fill in the limestone, because water will get in there. Rolling the die. And if that dam goes, it'd be like a roll of dominoes all the way down. Because what's the really big dam right here? Hoover. That Hoover Dam. Even though it's built on the Roosevelt, long story. Republicans come back to power. We're going to put Hoover's name on it. So that's basically all. Um, so he had some success, but then all blew up in 1907. Last thing for today the panic! Oh, 1907. Same deal. Uh, 1893. Banks made risky loans. They couldn't get the money back. And in fact, not only did Roosevelt's reputation get hammered by this, they didn't have any central bank to try to um, um, to try to give some kind of strength to the financial system to get money to the banks. And so. The Treasury Department actually gave J.P. Morgan, the financier at Investment Bank, millions of dollars in gold, and he gave it to banks, certain banks so they survived. This is a horrible system where he most certainly just helped his friends. It did enough to keep the crash from becoming as bad as 1893, but it led the United States to the belief they need some kind of would push for the idea that need a central bank. We need something. Because by 1907, the rest of the world was terrified of the American financial system. They blamed the US for the disaster in 73 and 93, and it almost happened here. And so, in 1908, Roosevelt could not run again, but he could pick his successor. Who did he pick? Yeah. William Howard Taft. And for the last time, the Democrats would nominate what guy ran in 96? William Jennings Bryan and Taft would win. Taft was not a progressive per se, but the bell's going to ring. So with that, we've covered a lot today. So we got just a little bit of Taft and then Wilson's progressive reforms. I got about a few other things, and then if there's any time left, there's a, there's a bunch of great Teddy Roosevelt stories. I will tell you them, but I want to make sure I have everything done before the test. Same thing with my chili story. I have to tell you my chili story. My own, my own very personal and silly vivid memory of my experiences with processed food. Nothing. I, I will not tell you. Maybe I'll tell you the story. But maybe I'll just warn you about it. I'll be out of the window and look in. Shiloh and I will be gone tomorrow. Who's this going? I'm going to bring the French kid in here tomorrow. Frenchy. You try to tell me one, one, only one French male or female. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> is the male one? I'm not sure if it's Louis or uh, So you expect one Frenchman to take care of two shallow. Yeah. Skipping, okay. So is I'll bring the whole whole army. I don't think it matters if it's a shadow here. No, she turned her back was I wanna okay, so we're just going to review stuff like that, you know, finish up the last thing. And I will film it. Wow, that was kind of almost a threat. <laughs>